Okay, um, good afternoon or good morning or good evening to everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome to the January Astrochemonar, sponsored by the ACS Astrochemistry Subdivision. Um, I should know from the outset that we had no idea when we scheduled this that there would also be impeachment hearings going on in, um, in the Capitol. Um, so thank you for um, spending a, an hour of your day with science. Um, so I'm David Woon, I'll be hosting today. Um, I'm secretary of the subdivision. Um, today I'm also joined by Partha Barra, who's the chair of the subdivision. Heather Abbott-Lyon is also hanging around. She's the chair elect. Kyle Cap Crabtree, who's the vice chair, um, runs the, uh, the uh, is very helpfully runs the, the whole Zoom session for us. Um, the past chair of, of the, of the uh, subdivision, Ryan Fortenberry, is not able to attend today. Um, I have a few things to say before we I introduce the first speaker. First of all, um, please submit abstracts. Um, uh, if you uh, want to give a talk at one of the upcoming um, um, astrochemonars, we have lots of slots open for contributed abstracts. So please um, go to the website and submit an abstract if you'd like to speak. Um, let's see, the, another point of business, um, the subdivision is currently accepting applications or nominations for our 2001 dissertation award. To be eligible, a nominee must have completed their dissertation between March 1st, 2019 and March 1st this year. Um, both the nominee and the nominator must be members of the subdivision. And please see the website if you're, for, for more information. A uh, couple more quick things. Um, January 19th is coming up quickly. That's the deadline for submitting an abstract for the ACS spring meeting. And also I wanna announce that um, our next speaker in February, our next invited speaker will be M. Sami El Shao, who's at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Okay, and one last point of thing, uh, point of business. If you have questions, you'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q and A tab that you can click on. Um, please type your questions in there and when Maria has completed her talk and Martin's completed their talk, his talk, um, we'll, we'll, um, we'll answer those questions to the speakers. Okay, so our first speaker today is Dr. Maria Drozdovskaya, who's a Swiss National Science Foundation and Visioni Fellow at the Center for Space and Habitability at the University of Bern. Um, she earned her PhD with Avina Van Dyshuk in 2016 at Leiden University. Um, Dr. Drozdovskaya works on astrochemical modeling, um, star forming regions and planetary, protoplanetary disks. Um, she's also performed radio observations of both star forming regions and comets. The connection between the ISM and comets is the subject of her talk today, which is entitled, as you can see on the screen, Prestellar Provenance of Comet 67P, Chiriuma Gersomenko. Go ahead, Maria. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everybody for tuning in to my talk today. So it's my pleasure to tell you today about one specific comet, Comet 67P, Chiromov Gerasimenka, and what we've learned about its origins, how its volatile composition came to be, so the provenance of this comet, and so potentially what has implications for all comets in our solar system. My talk will be split into two parts. I will kick off with a short introduction to comets in general, and then I will take a deeper dive into the chemistry of 67P and tell you all about the implications that its chemistry is telling us about. So I'd like to begin by telling you that there are many thousands of known comets in our solar system. And in fact, the total population has been estimated to be much greater, perhaps something towards a trillion. Comets are only rarely a spectacular show for the ground-based observer. So Comet Hill Bob that you see on the left-hand side of your screen was one such special occasion for us. Most comets are a lot fainter and you can't see them with the naked eye. Comets contain refractory components, which, by which I mean rocks and dust, as well as volatile components, gases and ices. Comets are considered to be relics of our solar system's formation. They're likely a leftover product of planet formation processes that took place in the early phases of our solar system's formation. One thing that excites me 
tremendously about comets is that we can actually probe these objects in situ with dedicated space missions. So we have a very unique window to study them, not only from the ground, but also really close up. So the question that I would like to answer is whether a comet can tell us the exact chemical ingredients that our solar system was made from initially. Typically, when you see a very bright comet, what you're actually seeing is the gaseous large coma. That's your bright object. What this bright gaseous coma is hiding within is a much smaller nucleus. And this nucleus is where the comets are harboring their dust and the ices. And so actually, when the sun heats the nucleus, then this is when your ices start absorbing. And this is what paves the way to the large gaseous coma that we can observe. Unfortunately, even after several dedicated missions to comets, including the ESA-Rosetta mission to Comet 67P, which monitored this comet for two years continuously, we don't quite know whether we have more dust or whether we have more ice in the cometary nucleus. So this refractory to ice mass ratio remains poorly constrained. And depending on the instrument and the analysis technique for 67P based on two years of data from several instruments, the range is still between 0.64 to 7.5. So we still don't know whether comets are icy mud balls or dirty snowballs. Our solar system has two main reservoirs of comets. There's the Kuiper belt, and then further out, there's the Oort cloud. Also, uh, we speak about Jupiter family comets. These are comets that have their orbit set by the orbit of Jupiter. But originally, Jupiter family comets most likely originated in the Kuiper belt as well. So Comet 67P is an example of a Jupiter family comet. And as I mentioned in the beginning, most comets are not very spectacular. And 67P was no exception to this. So on the left-hand side, you see the ground-based observer view of this comet, which is really something not very spectacular. However, when the ESA-Rosetta mission arrived at the comet, then it unveiled a much more spectacular object, something that was really remarkable. So let's dig in a bit deeper and figure out what do the molecules and the isotopic ratios, such as the deuterium abundance in the molecules in Comet 67P, is telling us about its formation. So in order to answer this, we need an instrument that can study the chemical composition of this comet. So the results I will present to you today stem from the Rosina instrument aboard the ESA-Rosetta mission, which, as I mentioned, monitored the comet continuously for two years. So it escorted the comet as comet experienced perihelion. Rosina stands for the Rosetta Orbiter Spectrometer for Ion and Neutral Analysis. And it is, in fact, a three-part instrument. There's the double focusing magnetic mass spectrometer, DFMS. There's the reflection type time of flight mass spectrometer, RTOF. And finally, the comet pressure sensor, COPS. Most of the results that I will present today stem from the DFMS instrument. And this is because it has a wide mass range. So you can study light, small molecules, as well as large, heavy ones simultaneously. It also has a high mass resolution of 3,000 at a mass overcharge of 28 at 1% peak height. So this means we can very accurately tell the individual mass peaks apart. So Rosina measures the coma gas is a 67P. And as the Rosina was very close to the comet when it was probing these gases, these are very likely directly probing the ices that are being hidden within the nucleus of 67P. Some of the findings that the Rosina instrument made was the detection of highly volatile molecules in this comet. So this includes molecules such as CO, N2, and big surprise was also molecular oxygen. So what you see here is the detection of the CO and then the detection of the N2 and the detection of the O2. And now you can actually also see why this requirement for the high mass resolution for this instrument was at mass 28 
It was specifically designed to be able to tell the mass peaks of CO and N2 apart. The fact that we're finding also very appreciable abundances of these highly volatile molecules, as well as a number of noble gases, is evidence that the interior of Comet 67P was never subject to significant heating since its formation. So this is supporting that comets are indeed some of the most pristine relics of our solar system's formation. Beyond these small light molecules, Rosina also uncovered a full zoo of various molecules in the coma of Comet 67P. This included even glycine, the simplest um, amino acid. Overall, what it, this is telling us is that this comet has a very high chemical diversity and also a very high chemical complexity in its volatiles. And so also within the ices that are in its nucleus. Of the 71 parent species that Rosina detected in this comet, 40 of these are also found in pre-stellar and protostellar regions. So in regions beyond our solar system in the early phases of formation. Also, when you consider the isotopic ratios and the volatiles of, the, of 67P, you find that most of them are non-solar. So this pushes us to compare the molecules that we're finding in this comet towards those that we're seeing in star-forming regions. Now, the tricky part here is that it's not easy, but it's a lot more feasible to probe the chemical composition very accurately down to the least, to the most least abundant uh, molecules in a comet when you're at the object and you're probing things in C2. Of course, distant star forming region, this is not achievable and you have to rely on ground-based observations of something that's very far. So it becomes a lot trickier to find a comparable good complete chemical inventory to compare with the comet. Nevertheless, um, we do have the alma pil survey. So this stands for the Unbiased Protostellar Interferometric Line Survey, which was an observational campaign that was carried out with ALMA in a wide frequency range between 329 and 363 gigahertz. So this is ALMA band seven, which was a large campaign led by Jess Jorgensen, where we studied the low mass young protostar IRS-16293-2422 on scales in which we were able to um, very clearly distinguish the A and the B binary components. So the observational campaign that was carried out, it was going down to roughly 70 AU scales so it's going down to protoplanetary disk scales in the system. And source B is favorably positioned in the sky for us to extract very accurate um, molecular identifications. So using the Rosina data for 67P and the results from ALMA pills for IRS 16293-242B, you can carry out this comparison of your cometary and your protostellar um, in chemical inventory comparison. So what you see here are three correlation plots split by the molecular families. So CHO bearing molecules, nitrogen bearing molecules, and sulfur bearing molecules. On the X axis, you always have the cometary abundances. And on the Y axis, you always have the protostellar abundances. And so what we're seeing is that for CHO bearing molecules, you have a very strong correlation. Correlation remains strong for the nitrogen bearing molecules. And there is a weaker correlation for the sulfur bearings. Um, there are several reasons for this. Sulfur bearing species are a bit tricky in this regard. When we put all this together, so if you just overplot all the chemical families on one figure, then the takeaway message is that these correlations that we're seeing in the CHO and the nitrogen bearing molecules strongly and then weaker in the other species, it's implying that, that there is a relation between what we're seeing in protostars and what we're seeing in comets. And what this is potentially suggesting to us is that there is 
a very good degree of inheritance across these stages of star formation, going all the way into the formation of a cometary nucleus, where then the molecular inventory is preserved. The scatter in the plot probably is telling us that there is, of course, some chemical alteration happening during this long evolutionary period. Besides the inventory itself, we can also look at isotopic ratios. So I will only discuss the uh, deuteration that we're measuring. For the case of water in 67P, it was determined that the DRH ratio is three times the terrestrial value. So it's quite high. Also, when you look at the doubly deuterated water and you calculate the ratio of doubly deuterated to mono deuterated relative to mono deuterated over non deuterated, then you get 17. Whilst if you do the math, the statistically expected value is a mere 0 0.25. So there's really a lot of mono and doubly deuterated water in 67P. It seems that this level of deuteration in the water is only really comparable with the early phases of low mass star formation. Otherwise, it's very hard to get so much deuterium into your water molecules. Another piece of evidence also comes from the deuteration and methanol. The Rosina instrument was able for the first time to detect deuterated methanol in a comet. This involved the detection of mono deuterated methanol, so CH3OD and CH2DOH, as well as the doubly deuterated methanol, and again, the both flavors that it exists. Unfortunately, with the Rosina instrument, we cannot tell the two flavors apart, um, but nevertheless, we can get an estimate for mono deuterated and doubly deuterated methanol as a whole. So of course, these are minor constituents when you think about them. So these are really minor species in the cometary coma. So for example, mono deuterated methanol relative to methanol is a mere 5%. But nevertheless, it's an important piece of the puzzle. Because again, if you do the math for this um, statistical correction of where your deuterium atom may be sitting in methanol, and you also account for the statistical error propagation in your Rosina measurements, then you get a D over H ratio of 0.71 to 6.6%, which is again high. Methanol is often considered to be the simplest complex organic molecule in astrochemistry. And so if you're finding that your methanol is highly deuterated, then this also is telling you that likely your other complex organic molecules have a lot of deuterium in them as well. And something like this, you can really only achieve via grain surface chemistry in the earliest phases of star formation. Otherwise, it gets very hard to put all this deuterium in there. When you compare, again, to a wider observational data set, so what I've done here is I've plotted the abundance of deuterated methanol in 67P, which is the final data point in all these triple plots, relative to methanol of all the individual flavors and then sum together and then compare them to prestellar cores in green, low mass protostellar regions in red, and high mass protostellar regions in blue, then what we're seeing is that the cometary numbers are in very good agreement with these early phases of low mass star formation. So your red and your green data points corresponding to prestellar cores and low mass protostars. So what this shows us is that the amount of cometary deuterated methanol relative to methanol agrees very closely with these earliest phases of star formation. So this brings me towards my conclusion slide and some of the, and I will try to give you the takeaway points that I want you to remember from my talk. So first thing I showed you is that there are correlations between protostar irison 6293 and comet 67b when you look at the volatile inventories, when you look at the CHO bearing volatiles, the nitrogen ones, sulfur bearing ones. You're seeing these correlations which suggest inheritance. Then if you look at the deuteration, be it in water or in methanol, then the amount of deuterium in these molecules in the comet is very high. Again, suggesting to us that likely the origin of these molecules is in the earliest coldest phases of star formation, pushing us towards the prestellar cores. 
if you start puzzling around with all the different isotopic ratios that have been determined, then you're actually kind of reconstructing the full sequence of formation of the different molecules. So I think tentatively what we're seeing is that water, CO, CO2, H2S, and ammonia, they're some of the first molecules to form in clouds as gases. Then HDO, HDS, and H2D and methanol comes second in cores and probably form as ices. And then finally, D2O and deuterated and methanol isotopologues, they will form last. And this agrees very well with what we know from studying pre-cellular cores and star forming regions. So it seems that yes, indeed, comets can tell us the exact chemical ingredients of our solar system. And actually even more so, it seems that they are actually revealing the full evolutionary sequence of low mass star formation for us. And there is very strong evidence that their comets in our solar system are really of pre-stellar provenance. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Well, unfortunately, currently there are no questions posted. Hopefully it's not a technical problem. Um, if you're having technical problems, maybe try posting questions in the chat box. Um, uh, Maria, I, I have a couple quick questions for you. Um, so given what we know about Comet 67P, have you gone back? I mean, you've done a lot of work um, with Iris 16293, right? Um, have you gone back to look there for things that you found in the comet because of the connection between the comet and Iris? So it seems that all the low hanging fruit is taken. Okay. It seems that all the ones that we have not found are very difficult to detect from the ground. Either they're too low abundance or the spectra are such that the lines are very weak, so you would need very long observational runs. So for now, there has not been an obvious candidate. Some of the most exciting guys that Therizina also detected are the ones that are likely semi-refractory in nature. And yeah, those will likely be in solid form once you start looking towards star forming regions. Um, but yeah, we should continue trying for the ones that are missing, for sure. sure. Um, and, and what is your sense? What, what's been most surprising about IRIS 16293, if anything? So I don't consider it to be atypical in any way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it has been conveniently positioned in the sky for us to study it very well. I think the more we look at it and the more we look at other low mass protostars, the less differences we're seeing. Um, I think the complex molecules that we found towards Iris 1693, we're now also finding towards an increasing number of other sources. If anything, I think something like this should be expanded beyond just this source. And I think if this only tells us about the ubiquity of the chemistry in star forming regions. Okay, did you have a question Partha? Uh, yeah, so there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Um, one from Martin Cordiner, can you comment on why the CH3OH deuteration fraction may be so much higher than H2O in comet 67P? So I, am, I think this has to do with the sequence of formation. So the mono deuterated water, if it forms first, it will be happening in the slightly warmer part of the core. Thereafter, you're actually getting a lot of doubly deuterated water. And if this is simultaneous with the formation of mono deuterated methanol, then actually you're in pretty good agreement. Um, so I think this sequence of formation is what's telling you, uh, what's explaining this difference if you're looking at the mono deuterated methanol to mono deuterated water. Okay, um, there's another one in the chat box. Um, I'm going to read it uh, from Chris Bennett. Um, he's wondering if you can expand a little bit on your point about what do you mean by D2O forming last? Is it formed only during the surface processes as a star begins to warm up? Uh, these ices, so it's more efficient or something else? 
Okay, I, I see the, I understand the question. Uh, no, no, so I don't necessarily mean it's the last thing to form or something like this. It was more out of the sequence of molecules or the list of molecules that I have here. Um, I think it's the last one to form out of that, but no, I don't think it's the last to form. Um, also, yeah, I don't dare say whether DTO would form entirely before warm up. I mean, ideally to get a lot of DTO, you want very cold conditions. So your 10 Kelvin pre-stellar core. Um, so I didn't mean last in that sense. Okay, I, I think that's the, the questions we're gonna have. Uh, I, I wish we could all applaud for you and you could hear our applause. Um, so, but thank you for a very good talk, Maria. Thank you for having me. Um, Martin, why don't you uh, start switching over to get your presentation up? Okay, um, so, and you probably want to get your, your, your audio and your video going. <laughs> okay, um, so our next speaker is Professor Martin Head Gordon. He earned his PhD with Sir John Popel in 1989 at Carnegie Mellon University. After a postdoc with John Tully at uh, AT&T Bell Labs, he joined the faculty at the University of California, Berkeley in 1992. Um, he holds a Kenneth S. Pitzer Distinguished Professorship in the Chemistry Department. He also holds an appointment at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Among his many honors, um, Professor Head Gordon is a fellow of the Royal Society. He's a member of the, the National Academy of Sciences. He's an American Chemical Society Fellow. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's a member of the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Sciences. Um, particularly relevant to uh, ACS, he was program chair and chair of the physical chemistry division in 2009 to 2010, and he was the chair of the subdivision in 2014 and 2015, into 2015. So his title today, as you can see on the screen, is Computational Explorations of Some Novel, novel Growth Mechanisms Leading to PAH and PANH Species. Thank you, Martin. Uh, well, thank you, David, and um, thank you, everyone, for um, uh, for taking a science break from the impeachment hearings, and I hope you're all doing as well as possible with um, our twin public health crises and um, public political crises. Um, anyway, science is a great consolation during trying times. Um, so um, I, I guess I would like to begin by maybe um, thanking Tamar Stein, who's done most of the work I'll tell you about. She um, was a wonderful postdoc in my group and is now an assistant professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And um, uh, David's introduction was extremely kind. I now, having told me, having told you guys all the things that I'm um, <laughs> that I've been honored with, I should tell you what I'm really not, which is I'm I'm at best a pedestrian astrochemist, and um, I very much enjoy collaborating with um, professional astrochemists. Um, and in the context of today's talk. Tim Lee and um, at NASA Ames is a key collaborator. Tim and I have enjoyed a more than two decade long collaboration. And Partha Barrow, one of your co-hosts, I think I'm, I've been interacting with for nearly a decade. So I owe them uh, a, a great uh, debt of thanks. And, um, and let's see if I can, let's see if I can get things going here. So, um, so my outline is as follows. I'll, I'll tell you um, a little bit of introduction. In other words, I'll, the introduction will focus a tiny bit on um, um, motivating the chemical problems, the, the, the novel chemical pathways that I want to um, tell you about uh, what we have discovered, and also a bit about the computational tools that we use to explore those pathways and um, then what you, you know, to, to what extent you can and cannot trust them. And then we'll move on to um, three sort of um, mini topics. The first one is um, the formation of 
um, maybe the simplest PAH ion um, from acetylene clusters. As essentially, this will be the post-ionization dynamic. So in other words, this will be relevant to, um, uh, to areas of the interstellar medium that have fairly strong radiation fields. Then we'll look at PANHs, this is the formation of the simplest PANH um, radical cation. And then, um, and then as you'll see in, in topics two and three, a lot of this is around novel, strong intermolecular interactions. And so we'll dig in and kind of a, um, a, a little postscript into what, are, what really is the driving force and how can we understand some of this strong association by looking at uh, the interaction between aromatic radical cations and pyridine. Um, okay, so um, um, so there is a lot of carbon in the galaxy, and um, and a lot of mystery about the um, the ways in which carbon changes its um, its form from. Um, atoms to small molecules towards polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which of course are really fused um, benzene ring type systems. Um, and then from there towards growth um, in the direction of particles and, um, and really um, um, a bit like the challenge of soot formation in combustion chemistry, there must be a transition from chemical growth, the making of new carbon-carbon and maybe carbon-nitrogen bonds towards physical growth where um, van der Waal forces drive the um, sticking together of, say, um, pieces of aromatic sheet. And um, we will be focused really on the question of how small molecules and ions convert in the direction of larger molecules toward PAHs. And, um, and so this will be essentially trying to assemble um, pathways that are chemically plausible that can, in some, that can in principle be investigated by laboratory experiments. And then ultimately, in terms of their interstellar relevance, they have to be validated against um, observational measurements. And, um, and we are really at a relatively early stage in, um, in, in putting, in unriddling this, um, this very complex set of pathways. But we shouldn't feel bad. The combustion chemists are not significantly ahead of us in terms of understanding the origin of soot in, um, uh, that is, carbon condensation in hot environments as opposed to our issue, which is very cold environments. Um, so, um, uh, Professor Hedgott, can I, can I interrupt you for a second? There's a color bar appearing in your uh, screen. I don't know if everybody's seeing that. I can see it. Can you move that a second? It's kind of blocking the view. It's oh. the bottom right corner. Okay, is that better? Um, I don't see any difference yet, but okay. maybe okay. others are not seeing this. Um, well, I can see it, I sent you a chat message. <laughs> okay, uh, shall I stop share and start share? Uh, I'm not quite sure on, on my screen. Yeah, I think, I think it is, uh, I don't see anything. Okay, so let's see. Okay, yeah, just start share then. Uh, yeah, it's still there. Um, it's blocking some part of it. So. Uh, Never mind, I guess, just go ahead. Uh, well, I apologize. I, I can't see it on my screen, but I, but I guess this is a, a defect of the otherwise flawless Apple software. Um, so, all right, well, I guess I will try and continue. Um, um, the, um, um, the, the focus that I'm particularly interested in is the nexus between this mystery of, um, of how carbon um, is evolving um, towards molecular precursors, then PAHs, and um, novel aspects of chemical bonding. And of course, ultimately we are making um, carbon carbon and carbon hydrogen and nitrogen carbon bonds whose bond strength is on the order of 100 kilocalories per mole. Um, and that should then be contrasted with the very weak kind of intermolecular interactions we would see in neutral PAH um, dimers um, that are not very large, two to three kcal say for the benzene dimer. But of course, the physical interactions grow and become much stronger as the paths themselves get larger. And so by the time you get to things like circumcoronine 
are dimerizing, one is going to have interactions uh, at least 10 times that strong. And if you go to things that then you know, double or treble the number of carbon atoms again, eventually the physical interactions make these pieces of matter sticky and one can transition from um, chemical growth towards physical growth. But the chemical growth is our present focus. And, um, and you know, if, if you know, most of us are pretty good uh, from the chemistry side at thinking about conventional bonding, but um, in ionizing environments, the bonding will often be unconventional because we will be making, we will, for instance, be um, detaching and attaching electrons. And in between, um, there will be radical neutral ion molecule chemistry that is relatively unconventional for most of us. And so things like the benzene dimer cation, naphthalene dimer cation, um, these have bond strength or interaction strengths that are actually right in the middle between um, chemical bonds and weak um, van der Waal interactions. So, um, so exploring those is our object and um, our tools are computational quantum chemistry calculations and, um, and, uh, and in some cases analysis, so-called energy decomposition analysis. Um, to give you a little bit of an idea of the state of kind of standard quantum chemistry today, um, this is um, some data summarizing one sigma errors in kilocalories per mole um, for a variety of interesting interactions. The most relevant to us at the moment is non-covalent interactions, but also thermochemistry as we make and break new bonds, barrier heights um, in terms of getting to and from those bond breaking processes, and isomerization energies. And um, simple, um, simple density functionals as represented here by PBE-D3 um, are capable of something like half a kilocalorie per mole for non-covalent um, dimeric interactions, and something like a one sigma error of 10 kilocalories per mole for thermochemistry. And so if your standards are tough, two sigma or three sigma, you can see that this level of theory is barely adequate unless there is favorable cancellation of errors. Things improve um, somewhat as you go to um, uh, so-called meta-GGAs represented here by MO6-L. By the way, this column labeled hash is the number of parameters in the, in the functional. A um, meta-GGA is considerably less well um, determined than a GGA and involves considerably more parameters. Um, the next level of sophistication in density functionals is the, is the level that we typically use for routine calculations. And these are the so-called hybrid functionals represented here by a, um, a 2006 and a 2008 functional, which knock down the errors in thermochemistry and barrier heights usefully and, um, and slightly improve errors for non-covalent interactions. Um, and then maybe the main point to take away is that over the past roughly six to seven years, um, my group has achieved progress that we're quite proud of um, that actually significantly um, lowers those errors further, particularly for non-covalent interactions that are weak. Um, you can see that we've achieved a two to a, at least a twofold reduction in one sigma error. So this is the kind of level of theory, this omega B97M-V functional that I will use in the calculations shown today. Um, in terms of analysis, when two, um, when two molecular or, um, or radical fragments come together, I like to think of the interaction as occurring in three stages. The first stage is to, um, is, is, is what might be termed a frozen interaction where the electrons of the interacting fragments don't reorganize except to obey basic principles of quantum mechanics, which is the Pauli principle. And, um, and so the frozen orbital interaction encompasses physical terms that include electrostatics, sterics or Pauli repulsion, and significantly in terms of physical condensation, van der Waal interactions. When the electrons begin to reorganize as two fra molecular fragments come together, we then think of this in two steps. The first step is a reorganization on the individual fragments or a polarization, an electrical induction. Um, and um, and we, um, we perform a constrained density functional calculation that prohibits electron flow or electron delocalization from one fragment to another in order to describe polarization. And then we release that constraint. 
So essentially, this is a variational procedure where we begin with a frozen orbital trial function. We then relax on fragments only, but prohibiting mixing between fragments. And then finally, we allow electron flow um, or dative interactions in the language of inorganic chemistry. And here's a, um, a triplex uh, that, um, that actually corresponds to the photoionization of glycerol. Photoionized glycerol is an unhappy radical cation and fragments readily to these three components, um, water, formaldehyde, and vinyl alcohol radical cation. And there are some strong intermolecular interactions. And to give you an illustration of how this kind of thing works, you can see that this first interaction here is a very short hydrogen bond, almost, um, almost a hydrogen bridge, in fact, because the OH bond on the left is one angstrom and the one on the right is 1.4. And this is something like five times the strength of a conventional hydrogen bond. And it reminds us that intermolecular interactions are fundamentally changed when, um, when electrons are removed or attached. Um, and in terms of driving forces, this is um, primarily um, a, a mixture of polarization and charge transfer. And, um, and then if we come to the second strongest interaction here, which is a 12 kcal per mole interaction between formaldehyde and vinyl alcohol radical cation, it's interesting that this is completely different in character. This one is dominated by attractive frozen interactions. Those interactions were repulsive before, and this is really a dipole charge interaction with a relatively long interaction. So in other words, Pauli repulsions or the unfavorable overlap of density is not at play here. And this interaction distance is too long for polarization or charge transfer to be dominant. And then finally, there is a weak or frustrated hydrogen bond that um, makes up the remaining interaction. So this is a, an analysis tool and an example. And with that, I will move on to my first topic, which is the dynamics of ionized acetylene clusters. And this is work done by Tamar Stein, and it was a collaboration with the experimentalist Musa Ahmed, um, friend and colleague at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and was published a couple of years ago. Um, well, I think that, um, you know, I, I told you that there's a lot of carbon in the galaxy. Something like 20% of that carbon is believed to be polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons collectively identified by a, the vibrational fingerprint, the characteristic um, IR bands, but not individually identified. And PAHs essentially are a bridge connecting small molecule precursors and those larger carbonaceous materials and it's at the point where PAHs must be made by chemical growth. Benzene itself is the gateway to PAHs. There are enormous diversity of proposed mechanisms for formation of benzene relevant to the ISM, which includes the combustion-derived HACA pathway, where um, a radical abstracts a hydrogen from a PAH and acetylene molecule is added and growth occurs that way, or ion molecule interactions or radical addition reactions, or in our context, um, the effect of radiation on acetylene clusters or ices. And so this is, these are results primarily computational, but I'll show you a, a, a snapshot at least of Musa's experimental data. So if we begin with um, three acetylene molecules, um, um, unionized, uh, they can get together in various, uh, in, in various local minima. And here are two of them. Um, this is essentially quadrupole quadrupole interactions. In other words, acetylene has no charge, no dipole. So how do the molecules arrange? They arrange to maximize quadrupolar type interactions. And there are um, and and structure A is favored if you're free to rearrange, and structure B is a local minimum with a small barrier to rearranging to reach A. If we then um, ionize um, those acetylene clusters, and then we launch a quantum chemistry geometry optimization on the ion surface at the geometry of the neutral, then without any reaction barrier, we spontaneously rearrange um, to form a C4 molecule, in other words, looking as a C4H4 um, isomer that 
has a 1.66 angstrom cc bond. Um, so we've, we've really made a, a molecule and then a, a solvent molecule. You can do the same thing for, um, for tetramers. Um, and, um, and with tetramers, you see barrierless formation after ionization of C6 species. And, um, and then you can explore the potential energy surface. We explore this several ways. One is by adding between 30 and 90 Kelvin of vibrational kinetic energy um, and then running molecular dynamics, ab initio molecular dynamics on the picosecond time scale. And in some trajectories, we see the emergence of the benzene radical cation. And um, the, the, the lower panels here are snapshots from the trajectory. The upper panel is showing you where on the potential surface the trajectory is passing through. And so in early times, we begin making the C4 species. We then form a C6 chain over a low barrier. And, um, and then that C6 chain can cyclize. And, um, and we finish up accessing the what is the global minimum on the C6 H6 plus potential energy surface which is benzene radical cation. Um, in the language of kinetics, all of the barriers to get to benzene radical cation are submerged. So the species will be accessed, and then it has lots of excess energy. It needs to dissipate that energy if it is survive, to survive and not to subsequently fragment. And that could involve emission of photons, or it could evolve, involve evaporation of solvent molecules if they are there. And so this next slide is just showing you um, the case of um, the dynamics of uh, post-ionization dynamics of the acetylene tetramer with one solvent molecule, which it then has um, both internal energy and um, kinetic energy relative to benzene radical cation and will evaporate away in the trajectories as can be seen at 2.5 picoseconds. So um, that is a very quick story about how one can make chemical bonds um, uh, on the computer, does it have any resemblance to what is done in experiments? Well, the answer is that molecular beam experiments allow you to form very cold clusters, or depending on how you do the ionization, you can prohibit the molecular clusters from forming in the molecular beam. So in the upper panel here is no formation, no cluster formation before ionization. <clears throat> And you can see there is no peak at mass over charge 78. In other words, there is no benzene radical cation. Um, clustering, in fact, is then occurring after ion fragmentation. But if, on the other hand, the experiment is done such that we are um, permitting very cold clusters to form before ionization, a significant peak at mass over charge 78 emerges and benzene cation is formed and stabilized presumably by solvent evaporation and then detected. So that's my first um, uh, vignette. My second vignette is to, then, um, is to then ask how do things look the same or different if we um, consider the admixture of hydrogen cyanide. HCN with a large dipole moment is well known to be abundant in the interstellar medium and therefore clustering um, either pure HCN clusters or mixed HCN acetylene clusters are potentially very interesting. And this is Tomas Stein's work in part with major contributions from Partha and Tim as well. And that was published earlier this year. Um, so um, of course the idea of the significance of PANHs is um, is, um, is multiple. Um, one significance is that some PANHs are precursors to nucleobases and therefore are prebiotic molecules. Um, and, um, and nucleobases themselves have not yet been identified to my knowledge in the ISM, yet nitriles certainly have, both HCN and also larger ones. Um, the growth mechanism, again, is um, a topic of debate and issue. Um, hacker type, um, analogs of hacker type pathways, radical attack on unsaturated closed shell molecules or ion molecule reactions. And in this latter category would then come um, the um, post ionization dynamics of, um, of clusters. Now, Musa Ahmed strangely could not be persuaded to put hydrogen cyanide into his molecular beam instrument, so I have no experimental results to show you, but I can show you our computational results. 
Um, and uh, if we just begin with the dimer of HCN, um, well, uh, this is now a strong dipole-dipole interaction, um, so significantly stronger than the acetylene interaction. Um, on the left here, HCN dimer. On the right, the heterodimer between HCN and acetylene with two nearly isoenergetic um, um, uh, structures. If we now remove an electron and then ask how do the atoms rearrange um, after ionization, we then get structures like the following and observe the shift from a 5 kcal per mole interaction energy to a 55 kcal per mole interaction energy in the HCN dimer and a shift from 2.67 to 54 and the a formation of a carbon nitrogen bond in the heterodimer. This, um, the structure on the left is actually quite common in the context of, um, um, of um, ion molecule interactions involving nitrogen. It's a dystonic ion. Um, the, um, a, um, a, a proton has been detached from one HCN and reattached on the other, giving HCNH plus as a charged um, a, a charged closed shell species. And on the right is the CN radical. So what we've done is separated the radical on the right and the charge on the left and a strong interaction between the two. That's a dystonic ion and there's the spin density just to keep us honest. It's isolated. So this is really CN dot on the right, HCNH plus on the left. And that's a very, very strong intermolecular interaction. And it involves electrostatic steering as well between the you know, a charged species and uh, a neutral one. And on the right, we have a strongly bonded iron. We've made a CN bond without a barrier. Um, and that bond length is in fact shorter than a normal single bond. It's got some multiple bond character. So these are interesting structures and, um, and show you how strongly growth should begin in, um, in, in these pure HCN clusters. If we go to the trimer, um, we can do the same sorts of things. There are pretty structures that correspond to optimizing electrostatic interactions. Um, three different isomers here, two of which are the linear and this cyclic one are very competitive in energy. If we do the same exercise and then optimize the structure after ionization, we see the same um, dystonic ion form. So here's HCNH plus and there's CN dot on the left with an interaction energy of 75 kilocalorie per mole. So in other words, the presence of a solvent molecule stabilizes that um, dystonic ion by something like an additional 20 kilocalories per mole. And then a second isomer appears, which is um, um, bound by a most impressive 96 kilocalorie per mole. So really the strength of a conventional chemical bond. And um, this is now a, an HCN dimer that has involved forming a CN bond. And the presence of the solvent molecule has removed the barrier that would have existed in the case of the dimer. That's why we didn't see this in the case of looking at the dimer. We needed a participating solvent molecule to allow barrierless formation of that very, very stable intermediate. This is something like 20 kilocalories per mole more stable than the dystonic ion. So, um, so this means that if we then go to ab initio molecular dynamics or to experiments, we would expect to see molecular growth beginning through either the motif of the dystonic ion above or this, um, or this stable structure, this um, uh, C2H2N2 plus dot structure. Um, and, um, and in fact, when we then went to do the cluster dynamics, um, we were a little disappointed. There was no formation of cyclic molecules seen on the picosecond time scale. And in fact, really negligible formation of chains longer than four non-carbon atoms. In other words, um, four non-hydrogen atoms. In other words, most trajectories led to solvated C2H2N2+. So after that, we then decided to look at mixed clusters and I'll show you representative results, one HCN and a couple of acetylenes in a cluster. And this is the distribution of results from the ab initio trajectory showing you that, well, a pair of acetylenes can dimerize and make the C4H4 plus dot species, or we can get the, um, 
or we can get the heterodimerization, we can make a cluster, and then we get some longer chain species. So this would be um, at least an isomer of benzene radical cation and would eventually access it. This would be an isomer of pyridine radical cation and in some cases accesses that structure as well. And we get even a little bit of um, eight chain, eight non-hydrogen atom species. So um, open chain species dominate, um, including six and eight heavy atoms. And if we then optimize the structures that we get to at the end of our trajectories, and we ran on the order of three to 400 different trajectories, each for about three picoseconds. But you can see that um, in addition to this, um, uh, uh, this conventional heterodimer that we saw before, we are, we are making some rings, a five-membered ring and the six-membered ring, and that is the pyridine radical cation. And you can see that at the level of um, uh, stoichiometry C5H5N+, um, this is by far the global minimum, and, um, and so that is accessed again through entirely submerged barriers. So, um, all right, so then the main conclusions here, ionization of the neutral clusters drives reactive dynamics and the formation of higher molecular weight ions. Um, the larger clusters, well, they have solvent molecules that participate far more strongly than one might think for, um, you know, for, say, HCN or acetylene, but that's, again, because of the ionized environment, and those solvating molecules help to stabilize the products by dissipating excess energy. Um, it's barrierless to get to four atom and even some six heavy atom species. Um, and, um, and cyclizing proceeds through submerged barriers, but not, we find, in pure HCN clusters. So we didn't make HCN the, 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 cycle, the, the cyclic structure of the trimer of HCN. All right, so just as a postscript then, um, to talk a little bit about, um, uh, uh, about the CN interaction, I'll show you the case of benzene pyridine and naphthalene pyridine dimer cations. And of course, um, if, it's, if it's benzene radical cation uh, and pyridine, charged dipole interactions are possible, but it's really this dystonic ion motif that we want to look at here. And in the case of um, pyridine um, stabilizing naphthalene radical cation, it's actually a 25 kilocalorie per mole stabilization. If we switch to benzene, it's actually 40. So the character of the PAH radical ion that interacts with pyridine very, very strongly affects the character of the interaction, even though visually these look the same. So what's the origin of the stronger binding with benzene? Well, this is the sort of thing where um, the best chemists amongst us might be able to say immediately. Um, and one of the reasons that I became gripped by developing EDA is that I view myself as not the best chemist. So we have an analytical tool we can use, and we can use this tool two ways, so-called vertical EDA at the optimized geometry of the complex, or what will emerge as particularly instructive on the next slide, adiabatic EDA, which is to optimize the structure and look at the properties on each constrained surface. In other words, the frozen surface where the orbitals, the electrons don't rearrange from the fragments, the polarized surface where they don't exchange electrons, and the full surface where all physical interactions are included. Okay, so here is the vertical EDA comparing benzene and naphthalene, and the first thing you see are some very big numbers, repulsive frozen interactions on the order of 150 to 170 kilocalories per mole, and it looks as though they are more repulsive in the case of the naphthalene system. So it looks as though um, it looks as though the stronger interaction of benzene is um, is um, is attributable, or to be exact, it's associated with um, uh, less unfavorable Pauli repulsions. The electrostatics are not greatly different. Um, and um, uh, and we can ask though, is 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 that an association or is it an origin? And so we address this by the adiabatic EDA perspective, and this is then optimizing the complexes on the frozen potential energy surface. And so in, instead of a 1.5 angstrom bond on the frozen surface, we make a weakly associated complex with a three to four angstrom distance between um, the two partners. And on the polarized surface, that distance shrinks a little bit, but does not fundamentally change in character. And then finally, 
a full surface, of course, makes a bond. So we see that in terms of this adiabatic EDA perspective, this interaction is entirely driven by electron delocalization, charge flow from the Lewis base, the pyridine, to the Lewis acid, the Pa radical um, cation. And then when we look at the adiabatic EDA components, well, because we're optimizing on each surface, they're all negative and they're small. And we see that the difference in the adiabatic EDA picture is really attributable to stronger charge transfer in the benzene radical cation pyridine system against the naphthalene radical cation pyridine system. This picture doesn't contradict the one that I showed you before, but this is really the driver. Um, and that's, uh, that's the point I want to make here about EDA, that one can use this as an analytical tool and, um, and any analytical tool has to be used with care. So our conclusion is CT drives the interaction, causing um, the benzene pyridine interaction to be stronger. And then with the aid of that insight, we think about chemistry and we remember that um, the ionization energy of benzene is higher than that of naphthalene, so the electron affinity is stronger and that's why that's the simple back of the envelope reason. Okay, so let me wrap up and, um, and thank you again for your attention. So on the methodological side, computational quantum chemistry is a good partner to astrochemistry in the sense that new density functionals and EDA can um, allow us to computationally explore novel paths to growth. Um, I showed you about post-ionization dynamics in um, acetylene clusters um, and also mixed acetylene HCN clusters leading to benzene radical cation and pyridine radical cation formation. In the case of the mixed clusters, it was particularly interesting to observe these dystonic clusters and the formation of these very strong dative bonds that look like regular chemical bonds, but are really driven by um, Lewis acid, Lewis base interactions as characterized most nicely by the adiabatic EDA. And, um, and this is a field with a long way to go. As I said at the outset, um, nothing I've told you in the talk changes that, but I hope we've contributed some interesting pathways, some interesting chemistry that sheds light on the way in which small molecules under ionizing conditions can associate to begin to make large ones. And thank you again to my collaborators. Thank you for funding. NASA funded the work on the mixed clusters. Um, DOE funded the work on acetylene clusters and density functional development. And the National Science Foundation has funded my work on EDA. All of our computational tools are um, put into software that we hope is usable. That's the QCHEM software package. And um, thank all my QCHEM collaborators, as well as um, particularly Tamar, Arthur and Tim, as well as Musa and Ueji. Um, earlier work on the benzene and naphthalene um, association with pyridine is, was done by Roberto Peverati and uh, was a collaboration with Sammy El Shao. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'm sure everybody would be applauding if, if we could. Um, thanks for a very good talk. Um, so there's one question that's been posted, and um, there's if you have a question, if you do have questions, please post them either to the chat or the Q&A. So Summer Johansson asks, uh, what temperatures were the, uh, the ab initio molecular dynamics trajectories run at? And what were the densities of the initial clusters? The, um, the temperatures were between 30 and 90 Kelvin, if I remember correctly. So in other words, they're cold, um, cold, but not literally zero Kelvin. Um, and um, uh, at zero Kelvin, we would have only had one, one classical trajectory. Um, and, um, and the um, starting structures were taken um, as, a, uh, as, a, as the um, initial optimized structures of the trimers, tetramers, and pentamers, at least, of, um, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the acetylene and mixed acetylene HCM clusters. So in other words, as you would find them in a molecular beam um, uh, who's characterized by a temperature less than 100 Kelvin. OK. Um, I'm, I'm not seeing any uh, other questions. So um, I have a couple of questions, at least one question here. Um, so you're, you're talking about, um, say, fairly large clusters of things like acetylene or acetylene and HCN, which are not likely to see aggregating in the interstellar medium, in the gas phase at least. Um, so there's that issue and you could 
think about um, how do you break this down into much smaller steps to get, you know, to get there. Um, the other question is, have you considered what would happen if this happened on grain surfaces, on icy grain mantles and things like that? Um, yeah, th those are both very relevant questions. So if, if, um, if one was considering um, um, you know, maybe things like um, um, icy mantles that, um, um, that um, um, are subject to a disturbance, a plume of some kind, um, then these cluster conditions would become relevant. Um, but I think it would be very interesting um, to actually also see whether these reactions can happen in the um, on the surface or in the interior of ices, and I, I would think that they should be able to happen. There are there are obviously some steric constraints that are um, stronger um, on the surface and even stronger in the bulk that will have an influence on the disposition of products. Um, unfortunately, those things also have a strong influence on the feasibility of the ab initio dynamics, at least in our hands. So we haven't done any, anything like that yet, but it, indeed it would be very interesting. Um, oh, here's a question. Um, let's see, uh, it, this is from Chris Bennett. Um, at those low temperatures, does the argon play a role in the formation of clusters in the experiments? Uh, can it be ruled out in the experimental validation of your um, acetylene experiments forming benzene? I know in the Crestu apparatus, argon can't be used at low temperatures due to cluster formation. Yes, argon does cluster and argon will cluster with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with acetylene. Um, um, I mean, I, I, I guess, I guess the way the way I, I thought about it is that um, is that you know it's it's a far worse solvent molecule. Um, in other words, an argon, an argon atom can you know can be kicked off, can carry away kinetic energy. Um, I doubt that it has a direct influence on the chemistry, um, although. Um, you know, the, there are sort of exotic ionization phenomena where an electron could, say, initially be ionized from argon, and that could be used to then do soft ionization of, um, um, of an electron from an associated um, molecule in a mixed cluster. So that, that's a little bit exotic. I would not expect that to, you know, to be important compared to the cr large cross-section for direct ionization, but those are just a a few reactions to that. If Musa were here, he could um, he could probably um, comment on on you know, in, in more depth because he's done such a diversity of um, of molecular clusters um, seeded out of argon. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, I guess we're done with questions. So um, thank you, Martin, and uh, thank you, thank thank Maria again, um, and thank everybody for attending. Um, when there's other things that you might be interested in looking at. Um, and tune in again on uh, February 10th for our next Astro Seminar. So thanks, everybody. Thank you.